Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in to a very special, very special whiteboard Wednesday. They're all every every whiteboard Wednesday is special. I've been saying that the last couple of weeks. Special whiteboard Wednesday. Uh, it is special though, in a sense, because today is uh, well, this is Holy Week. Uh, Palm Sunday on Sunday marked the beginning of Holy Week. Hey, Susan Gibbons there. Hi, Mom. Carol's there. Good to see everybody on today uh, in this uh, Whiteboard Holy Week edition of Whiteboard Wednesday. So the uh, the official title for today, uh, what it's called in the church calendar, is Holy Wednesday. Kind of a boring title. Becky's there. Hi, Becky. Uh, looking forward to... Um, to uh, Good Friday and Easter Sunday. We've been uh, prepping for that around the church, and uh, we're excited about that, obviously celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, the big high point of the whole, of all the whole church calendar. Today's Holy Wednesday. So today in uh, in history, Jesus would have uh, been, uh, in the Bible, it says this is right bef- this is the day before the Passover feast. So he's going to have his uh, his last supper with his disciples and uh before he does that he's he's in jerusalem you remember on palm sunday he came into jerusalem to celebrate passover and uh there were uh nobody knows exactly how many people in the city but uh let's say a hundred thousand to three hundred thousand people in the city of jerusalem there's not enough people in jerusalem to hold everybody for this week-long festival and so jesus and his disciples are staying in uh, a guy named simon's house in the nearby town of bethany that's a terrible looking house here i tried to draw a little house <laughs> So Jesus and the disciples are just outside of Jerusalem, and uh, they're probably going in every day toward Jerusalem and uh, and celebrating the Passover there, celebrating going back, celebrating in Bethany, which is a town. He stayed at his friend Simon's house. Today he was anointed by uh, Mary. Was it Mary or Martha? Anyway, um, and then tomorrow he'll be celebrating the Last Supper with his disciples. The day after that, well, that evening, he'll be taken away as he's praying in the garden that evening uh, after the Last Supper. And uh, the uh, the sol- soldiers and the temple uh, guards will come and take Jesus away. He'll be on trial all throughout the night. Uh, Jesus won't get any. Oh, Linda's there. Good to see you, Linda. I- Gonna gonna just assume Darlene and uh, and uh, Diane are there too, uh, but Jesus won't get any sleep tomorrow night. He will be awake. They'll take him away. His disciples were falling asleep while they were trying to pray, uh, but Jesus was praying all night long. And then the the guards took him. Then he's on trial all that night and in through the day. Finally, Pontius Pilate sentences him to crucifixion. And uh, and by that time it's Friday morning, so that's a Good Friday, and he is uh, crucified and he dies uh, around 3 p.m. It's hard to tell exactly noon or 3 p.m. on that Good Friday, which would have been historians think it's either I can't remember the exact date. I think it's either April 6th in 30 A.D. or it's like April. Or, or 33 AD. Nobody knows the exact year. The way the moon phases line up and the Passovers line up, you can, you we, we know it was one of these two years, either 30 AD or 33 AD. If it was 30 AD, it would have been like April 6th. If it was 33 AD, it would have been like April. I don't know exactly. I, I should have looked it up. Um, but anyway, so Holy Week. All that to say, Holy Week. Very special uh, in the church calendar. And today, is Wednesday of Holy Week. He'll be going back into Jerusalem for the last time tomorrow. Jesus will be with his disciples. Well, what I want to talk about today is the what happened on Easter, which is what we call the resurrection. So Jesus was crucified, killed. He died a real death, was taken off the cross on Friday, and very quickly buried in a tomb, the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, which was a rich uh, 
friend of his or, or friend or follower of his that he he offered up his up his tomb for Jesus to be buried and they had to do it very quickly because for the Jewish people on Friday evening that marked the start of their Sabbath so in the Jewish calendar still they do this uh, to this day they don't uh, consider days to start like we kind of consider your our days to start at midnight you know what i mean midnight kind of marks the the beginning part of the day well in in for many other cultures it's different so the day ends when the sun goes down right so here's the day and the night and though so the sabbath is a friday for the jew well it's saturday for the jews but it starts friday night if this makes sense so if it's friday jesus dies on the cross here they have to hurry up because night is when Sabbath starts and you're not supposed to do anything on the Sabbath, right? So uh, they quick got Jesus down off the cross. He was dead. They, the soldiers confirmed it by uh, sticking him with the spear. Uh, the Gospel of John says that blood and water poured out. Uh, it's kind of an interesting phrase. People wonder why water comes out and maybe there's some spiritual significance to the water. I'm sure there is. But it, it definitely, anatomically, it means the soldier pierced his heart. There's a, uh, uh, your heart is surrounded by like a sack of water. And so uh, when water and blood comes out of Jesus' side, the soldier stuck a spear right through his heart. At any rate, he's dead. They take his body off the cross, and they very quickly put it in the tomb. Uh, because in a couple hours, it's going to be Sabbath, and we can't do anything on Sabbath. So they just wrap him up very quickly. and. Uh, close it off and seal off the tomb. So uh, then on Sabbath, the next day, Saturday, uh, everybody's uh, in mourning, really. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're in mourning and you're practicing the Sabbath. And then Sunday morning, Sabbath is over. So the women go to the tomb to uh, prepare the body the way the bodies are supposed to be prepared. You know, they had to do it very quickly. So they were coming to the tomb on Sunday to do that, and they found the tomb was empty. And that's a very exciting story. We're going to talk about that on Sunday. That's Easter Sunday. But they found that uh, Jesus' body wasn't there because he had been resurrected. He wasn't resuscitated. He was resurrected. We talked about that in a couple whiteboard Wednesdays ago. This isn't just coming back to life. He has a new, he is part of the new creation that God's bringing in. Uh, a resurrected body. And this body is the same, but it's also different. And the, the gospel writers have a, even a hard time explaining just how different Jesus' body was. People thought, is he a ghost? He says, no, I'm not a ghost. Look, I'll eat with you. and uh, But then he would show up in rooms when all the doors are locked, and some people would talk to him, and they wouldn't recognize him uh, at first, but then they'd recognize him. Um, you could touch him. You could feel him. Uh, very interesting, this idea of resurrected body. Hey, Rick Everly's here too. Good to see you, Rick. That happened on Easter Sunday. We're excited about that. We're excited to see you at church on Easter Sunday. You can also tune in online. We have a cool uh, uh, clip that uh, my brother-in-law put together of uh, that kind of, uh, it's on our church page. If you want to share that and invite your friends and family to join you on Easter Sunday, like I said, it's the big day for the church. But resurrection now. Here's the deal with resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus is the most important part of our faith as Christ followers, as followers of Christ. I know Christmas is a big holiday, and it's very important, obviously, that we celebrate uh, Jesus being born. But the resurrection of Jesus is, every, is what our faith hangs on. The Apostle Paul said, if, if it's only for this life that we have hope, then we don't really have hope. We're kind of, he said, we should probably be pitied if all these followers of Christ are just kind of like, you know, we we have hope that something better is coming, but something better doesn't really come. And that's kind of sad. You kind of feel sad for that person. But we have a hope and we have an assurity of it because Jesus was resurrected. We see God said, God let us peek behind the curtain and say, hey, listen, death is not the end. So it's very important to us. And I want to talk about, uh, I want, want to give you guys a couple of good things that I hope you can lean on 
and have confidence in the resurrection. So I want to share with you a passage from 1 Corinthians 15. And if you're interested in this idea of resurrection, because it's a very confusing idea, that it's it's this it's our same body, but it's it's different. And what does that difference mean? The entire chapter of 1 Corinthians 15 is is all about resurrection, how Jesus was resurrected, and what that means for us, that we will be resurrected as well. I've talked about that in Whiteboard Wednesdays prior. But if you're interested in resurrection and what that might mean, you'll get answers in 1 Corinthians 15. But you might also get some more questions because it is confusing. I'm going to shrink this down a little bit. Here's what the Apostle Paul says to the Corinthian church here. There we go. He says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. So he's reminding them of what they already know. I want to remind you of this. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word that I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. So we got to, there's, I want to remind you of this good news that is our hope. And here's what the good news is, he says. What I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Here's the gospel. That Christ, excuse me, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Or just at least that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Kephas, that's uh, the Aramaic word for Peter. So I'll write Peter here. And then to the 12, that's his 12 uh, apostles. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And that's kind of the, that's Paul's and the other biblical writers' way of saying uh, some of these people have died since then. This i fallen asleep. Some of these people have died since then, but Jesus appeared to Peter, the 12, uh, 500 brothers and sisters. Some of them are alive. Some of them are asleep. Uh, then he said, uh, or some of them have passed away. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. So maybe you're familiar with the, the story of Paul on the road to Damascus as he's persecuting Christians. Jesus appears to him on the road of Damascus and completely shatters his, his world and uh, makes him rethink everything that he's been doing. He becomes a Christ follower at that time. This is what he says. He said, Jesus appeared to me also. So Paul includes himself in this list. But the point is, and I think some people forget this too. Paul says, uh, he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born, meaning he's he he's he's out of order a little bit but uh last of all Jesus appeared to me also one of the reasons we don't see the resurrected Jesus now is that we have well Paul was the last one to see him we shouldn't expect to be seeing the resurrected Jesus around here and there in fact Jesus himself said listen I'm going away and I'm sending the holy spirit and the holy spirit is going to dwell in you and it's going to be better than if I was here uh so we should not be expecting to see the resurrected Jesus. I know some people see him in toast and that kind of stuff. <laughs> and that's not the resurrected Jesus. That's just an image of Jesus, right? But the we we understand Jesus, the ascend the resurrected Jesus has ascended into heaven, and that's where he's sitting. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father currently. God with us is the Holy Spirit. Okay. Maybe that doesn't matter so much. But here's the important thing. Here's the gospel, Paul says, that you need to remember. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised on the third day. And he appeared to all these people. And I think one of the reasons Paul wants to be clear about this is he wants you to know, and the Corinthian church to know, listen, this is not a private thing. Uh, all the other religions in the world are, are private affairs, meaning um, you've got some person and he has some kind of thought about what God is like, and he goes out and he tells you what his thoughts are about that. So whether this, maybe this is Muhammad in, in uh, Islam. Muhammad was in a cave and he gets a vision from an angel. Then he goes out and he, and he, uh, he shares the, 
the the words that he got again it's a private experience that he had and now he's going out and telling a bunch of people you could think uh, buddha buddha had some thoughts about how things are and then buddha goes out and tells people about it uh joseph smith the mormon founder he gets a vision from an angel it's very it's all private and then he goes out and he tells people about it you understand what i'm saying it's is all it's typically that's just how religions do it paul is clear to say this idea this jesus christ is not a private idea that somebody had and then somebody spoke it about the whole uh gospel all the whole story of jesus is it's it's all public jesus himself didn't even write anything right it's people later on writing about him but it's all public. It's all there so everyone can see it. So it's not somebody's private uh, thoughts about the matter. It's Jesus going out into the real world and living in the real world with everybody around who is seeing it and experiencing it and, and sees for themselves what he's doing. This is, not, this is not a story that somebody makes up. Same thing with the resurrection. Uh, the resurrection isn't Paul's just good idea of what happened. But he, Jesus really walked out, of, walked out of a real tomb that was really there. It's really empty. Uh, his body was real. John, the author, writes, uh, if you read 1 John or the Gospel of John, he says, this is the, the word of God came and he, he dwelt among us. We heard him. We touched him. We uh, saw him. We, you know, all of our senses were engaged in this. And uh, as, as Paul says, as Jesus was resurrected, he was really there with us. He appeared to Peter. He appeared to the twelve. He appeared to five hundred people. This is a this is a public thing. This is not something I'm just making up. And Paul says, "I want you to I want to remind you of this." Anyway, and it's a, it's a good reminder for us as well that this is a, a much different way of doing things than how other religions do it. It's public for everyone to see. It's a matter of record, right? It's a matter of historical record. And Paul, I think, would even encourage the Corinthian church. Listen, if you have questions about this, talk to any one of these people. They're still around. Some of them are, most of them are still alive at this point, although some have fallen asleep. Uh, some have passed away. Now, of course, uh, us living today, it's it's been too long. All of the people that Jesus has appeared to, they have all fallen asleep. They've all died. So, um, so what can we say about this? Well, I want to go do a little timeline here for you because the other thing sometimes people will say uh the other thing people will say is that, that people just made this up like some group got together later on and just made up this whole thing well here's uh here's why that can't be the case either and we're gonna have to do i'm gonna ask you to put on your thinking caps a little bit and we're gonna do some history we're gonna I know maybe you guys don't like history. You had a bad time in history class in school, but uh, bear with me for a little bit because I think this is going to be helpful uh, to to uh, answer that question that maybe some of us struggle with. Is this really real? Do you think someone just made this up, or did this really happen? This this will help you, I think. Now we have the Bible, right? And uh, at some point there was a man named Paul, and he wrote down this letter to the Corinthian church. Uh, and we have that letter. It's in, it's in the Bible, right? Now, when we think about Jesus, I'm going to do a little timeline here. And I'm going to use the cross for the date of Jesus' death. Now, I mentioned earlier that historians will say and it doesn't matter, historian, like a Christian historian or an atheist historian, you know, when, you, when you're studying history, it doesn't matter who you are. Uh, historian, any historian will tell you Jesus is going to die at either 30 AD or 33. So we're not sure. But for the sake of nice, easy numbers, I'm just going to say, let's say it's 30 AD. Hold on. Let's say Jesus dies at 30 AD. <laughs> now, over here, on this end of the spectrum, you've got the latest uh, book of the Bible that was written is the book of Revelation. 
That's the latest one, chronologically speaking. I mean, it's the last one in the Bible, but it's also the latest to be written. Nobody's sure exactly when. It could be, I've heard some people say 70 AD and as late as 90 AD, right? And now maybe you've heard this too, that some people will say, well, listen, that's a span of, that's a span of, let's go, let's, let's say the later date is true. That's a span of 60 years, right? So 60 years, well, man, you know, a lot can happen in 60 years and who's to say in this, that, and the other 60 years ago, although in, in terms of history, 60 years is not that long ago, right? If, if there's people who are watching right now who could tell you what happened 60 years ago. Um, but Revelation is not the earliest uh, book that we have in the Bible. It's the, it's the latest. So we've got gospels that are written, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, Mark seems to be the gospel that was the first one to be written. Mark, uh, one of the easy ways to date the gospel of Mark, and let's say the, the other gospels are here, and these are the stories of Jesus. One of the easy ways to date the gospel is uh, a very big thing happened in 70 AD, and that was the temple was destroyed. So the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Now, when the Gospel of Mark was written, the temple was still around. It was still there. So we know Mark was written before 70 AD. So some people will say like 50 AD, historians will say. So now we're now we're a lot closer to realize. Now, now we're just 20 years out from where, from, uh, from Jesus' life. But some people will say, well, that's still 20 years. That's a long time. And... Um, can we do any better than that? And the answer is, yeah, we can get a lot better than that. Because remember, the guy named Paul. Before the Gospels were written, during this 20-year stretch, a lot of things were happening, right? Peter was out, going out. Uh, he was writing things. James, the brother of Jesus, was writing things. Paul was going out and writing things. And the letter we wrote was written by this guy named Paul. So uh, Paul wrote... 1 Corinthians in at some point in time. And we don't know exactly when, but we can we can try to figure it out. So let's let's think like detectives here. So we're gonna have we're gonna do some fun detective work if you're still if you're still with me here. Let's look at this passage in 1 Corinthians and see if we can get any clues about uh about when this happened and if we can get any closer to the cross. So Paul says, now brothers and sisters. He writing to the Corinthians, right? The Corinthian church. I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. And then remember, and then Paul goes and gives a, a little uh, Cliff Notes version of the gospel for them. Now, what's he saying? He says, he's saying, uh, I want to remind you what I already told you. So it'd be one thing to know when the First Corinthians was written, but it's another thing to say, well, wait a second. Yeah, First Corinthians might have been written a little later. Let's say First Corinthians was written in, in, let's just say it's 40 AD. Now let's say it's let's say it's 50. Let's say it's later. But what's Paul saying here? He's saying. He's not making up the gospel right as he's writing the letter. He's saying, I want to remind you what I already told you when I was with you. So, yes, he's writing it at, let's say, maybe 50 AD, but he's telling them that I already told you this, right? So he's reminding them of what he already told you. I want to make sure we're, we're good on this. I want to remind you, I already told you this stuff. I'm not making it up now. I already told you this. So what we really want to know is, when was Paul in Corinth? When... When was Paul in Corinth and when would he have told them this gospel? Right? Well, let's look. We have to go to the book of Acts, which is the which is the uh, chronicle of Paul and Peter's journey. And we'll find, let's look and see when he was in Corinth. It says here that Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half. Okay, here's when he was there with them in the church, right? Teaching them the word of God, right? Yeah, the, the letter of 1 Corinthians is just reminding them of when he was there. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, 
the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. So here's something that happened when Paul was in Corinth. Now, we've got a clue here about when this might have been. He, Paul was in Corinth while Gallio was proconsul of Achaia. So when was Gallio proconsul of Achaia? Then we can find out when Paul was in Corinth. Well, lo and behold, look at this. A couple years ago, some archaeologists uncovered this stone here. It's written in Greek. They found it in Achaia. And I don't know if you guys can read Greek or not, but this word in blue, this is G, this is A, L, L, I, O. So this is an inscription about, and if you can read the rest of it, it's about the proconsul of Achaia, and his name is Gallio. We've got this today. It's in the British Museum or something like that. Oh, hey, this is that guy that was leading Achaia when Paul was there, right? Again, this is the Christian faith is a, it's a public thing. It's a matter of historical record, right? These things actually happen. You can go to the Holy Land if you want, and you can see all these places that Jesus lived and the guys lived, uh, men and women lived. Uh, so here's Gallio. And what the stone says, if I were to read, were to read the whole thing, uh, I could read some of it maybe, but uh, it says, this is Gallio, proconsul of Achaia, and he was proconsul of Achaia from 40 to 45 A.D., they didn't use the, they didn't use A.D., but if you calculate out the dates when he was in charge, it's during this time. So, all right, that helps us in our, in our uh, investigation. So, we know if Gallio was there and through, and, uh, and uh, if Gallio was in Corinth while Gal, or with, excuse me, if Paul was in Corinth while Gallio was proconsul, then that means Paul had to be in Corinth 40 to 45 AD. So this is when, this is Paul in Corinth. And this is when Paul would have been telling them, uh, good question, Linda. This is Acts chapter 18. Sorry, I need to write these things down. I say that every week. This is Acts chapter 18. Uh, Linda, the main thing we're looking at is 1 Corinthians 15. Now, Paul's in Corinth 40 to 45 AD. And, and he, what he says is, I want to remind you of what I told you when I was there. And here's the gospel. I'm, I'm preaching. So already we have the gospel message about Jesus Christ dying for our sins, buried, raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and all these appearances. And now we're 10 years out, right? Isn't that, that's much, much closer. We're talking about 10 years after the fact. But let's get a little bit closer. <laughs> let's get a little bit closer. We're going to do a little bit of dig digging. Because what does Paul say? Again, Paul's in Corinth telling them this. Here's what he says. Paul says, For what I received... I passed on to you as of first importance. So he's saying, when I was in Corinth, I was giving I was giving you the gospel that I already received. And that makes sense, right? Paul's not making up the gospel when he's in Corinth. He is passing on to them what he already received, meaning Paul got the gospel before he was in Corinth. Even earlier, when did Paul get the gospel? Well, uh, we can look at this. Although I didn't, uh, I didn't break it out. It's uh, hold on just a second. I, I apologize. I, I forgot the, to put this part in here. <laughs> uh, let me copy it real quick. It's. Uh, it, Okay, here we go. So remember, Paul is passing on the gospel to them. When did Paul get it? See, when I copy it over, it doesn't say where I'm getting these things from. Okay, let's read this. This is Galatians 1. This is a different letter to a different church. 
uh, but it's going to help us in our detective work here. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, Paul says about himself, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. Verse 14, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas, that's Peter, and stayed with him 15 days. So, we're talking about when did Paul receive this gospel. Obviously, he received the, the revelation of Jesus there on the road to Damascus. But when did he get this block of teaching about the Peter and the Twelve and uh, appearing to the 500? When, when did he find all this stuff out? Uh, there's two options. Peter Eater, Peter Eater, Paul either got this gospel from the Christians in Damascus. So he's on his way to Damascus. And when he's there, there are Christians in Damascus. So we either got it here. But then he says, I didn't consult anybody. I went away to Arabia for three years. And then I went back to Jerusalem after three years, and I met with Peter. And if he didn't already get the gospel from the Christians in Damascus, he would have got the gospel there in Jerusalem after three years. So now let's see. Uh, Jesus dies in 30 AD. Paul immediately, the church is immediately persecuted. The On the road to Damascus, that, that event's going to happen let's say at the at the latest well most people say 31 it'll it'll happen it happened a couple months after but let's say it happened a year after in 31 AD paul either got it there in 31 AD in damascus or it was 3 years later in 34 AD when he went to jerusalem now here we're talking about a period at the latest four years, which is four years is, you know, that's just a couple years ago. And already we got this now. And again, this is when Paul gets the gospel. And it's not like Paul would have got the gospel. It's not like they would have made up the gospel for Paul, right? Paul says, I received this teaching that was already around when I got it. So somewhere in between this span of time, and uh, most historians think it's even it's even closer. Like I said, it's even one year later, there was already this block of teaching that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, that he appeared to Peter, to 12, to 500 other people, to James, to the all the apostles. And, and then Paul tacks on this little part. And he also appeared to me. He attacked, he tacked that part on to the, to the thing that he received. But this is either one year after Jesus, or it happened just a couple months after uh, Jesus would have died. That's the only time, let's say at the most six months to a year, from the time Jesus is dead to this, this teaching that is being spread. Obviously, we know that it would have happened right then, right? But this, this formal teaching that's already written down and already being spread across the world is six months to a year after the event, which is very, 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 very close, right? Can you remember what happened six months ago? Sure you can. If Jesus appeared to 500 people six months ago, uh, that's a big deal, right? 500 people are experiencing that and uh, and talking about it. And, uh, and so looking at that and doing this little detective work, again, you got to put on your thinking caps and do some detective work, but it's just uh, so encouraging to realize um, this is not, this is not something that somebody made up or somebody, even a group of people made up years and years later. This is a very public thing that many, many people knew about and many, many people experienced. And it's that, uh, that wonderful 
public ministry of Jesus and public resurrection of Jesus that uh, we can really hang our hat on and really have hope in. Because that uh, resurrection hope for the very first believers is the same resurrection hope that we can have today. That all the things that we're going through and all the things this world is going through is not the end. Um, God's got great things in store for us. It's wonderful. Well, have a great Holy Week. Again, hope to see you either online or in person. We've got a um, Good Friday service, 6.30 p.m. at church and here on Facebook and a 10.30 Easter service on Sunday here in person and uh, on Facebook. Hope to see you then.